Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. This one is a little bit different and it's a bit of a sad story and a happy story. I have a bit of a history with this piece. In this video I'm going to be stripping off that white paint and if you've ever stripped white paint from teak or a walnut you'll know that it is a pain in the The real kicker here though, that white paint is entirely my fault. My name is Angie and I refinish furniture. Sometimes I paint and sometimes I don't, but I always do what I can to save old pieces from the trash. Welcome to my workroom. Right, so let's talk about this. This is a piece that I did about four years ago roughly and I was in a really tough spot financially. I was just starting out flipping furniture as a business and I pretty much needed every penny. At that point I didn't know a whole lot about mid-century furniture. I knew it was very appealing to people but I unfortunately didn't do much research on this piece when I came across it. Even so, there was something about this piece. I did not want to sell it but at that point I literally had no choice. This is what the piece is supposed to look like. This is very similar. This is by the same maker. It would have had two doors in the front. The piece did not have the doors when I picked it up. I stained the drawers and the leg assembly two different colors. I opted to paint part of it. I painted part of it white. You can't deny this is a beautiful piece painted, but you know, skipping ahead a few years and knowing what I know now, I feel like I did this piece a disservice. So I'm gonna do my best to not necessarily bring it right back to original, but I am absolutely taking this paint off. So under this white paint is beautiful teak veneer, and then these shelves and the inside here is mahogany veneer. These are where the two doors would have latched on either side. There's a little hole that I <laughs> quite terribly filled in with some filler. And having a look at the drawers here, I do have the option to strip these back down to the raw teak. I personally don't mind the two-tone look and this is a piece I'm going to be keeping. Here's the story about this piece. When I sold it, reluctantly, I asked the person I sold it to, please, please let me know if you ever want to sell it. And about two months ago, she wrote and said that they were doing a massive renovation and this piece no longer fit in with what they had planned for the house. So I bought it back. I paid $50 less than I sold it for, but I was still super excited to have it back. So now it's time to actually get to work here. I'm using my favorite stripper, which is circa 1850. I do believe this was painted with a uh, chalk paint and that's what I started out using way back when. And I've since moved on to Fusion, which is a lot smoother, but you can see here that there's actually some rush strokes as well as a little bit of yellowing and just some general scuffs. And it's not the pristine <laughs> piece I remember. If you saw my video a few weeks ago where I was stripping a light gray paint off of a walnut dresser, you already know what I'm in for here. <laughs> Wood like teak and walnut, they have big open pores and unless there's some sort of barrier coat in between the paint and the wood, like a coat of shellac or a couple of coats of lacquer, prior to paint, that paint gets in all of those little pores and it is just a huge pain to get it out. But this is going to be a multi-part process. So part one here is using the stripper and scraper to get off the bulk of the paint. As much as I hate seeing all those little white flecks in the wood grain, this is actually a really exciting part for me because I honestly don't remember if there was a specific reason that I painted the piece other than I wanted to clean it up a little bit and sell it. Part of me was worried that I would find damaged uh, veneer underneath here, but so far so good. This paint is fairly thick, so obviously I'm gonna to have to do a few rounds with the stripper and actually a few rounds with the stripper and some other tools as well.
For the curved areas, I'm using this blade. This actually goes onto a handle and it comes with different um, contour blades. I just opted to use the blade by itself without the handle. I have to be really careful here along the edge because the mahogany veneer on the inside is running front to back and the teak veneer on the front trim is running horizontally across the piece so I need to be careful not to scrape too hard on either one of those where it changes direction. Now, I just want to take a moment here to address something, obviously in regards to this piece, but outside the scope of this video as well, and that is whether or not it's okay to paint mid-century pieces. That is incredibly subjective. I already know there are going to be MCM purists watching this video, shuddering. <laughs> obviously grateful that I'm trying to rectify my error, but I just want to say this. Not every piece of mid-century furniture is super valuable. This piece here, I can honestly say I did make a mistake on. This is actually a fairly rare sideboard and I deeply regret having painted it. I'm very happy to have it back because I, for some reason, was really drawn to this piece emotionally. It's strange. I'm not usually like that with furniture. And it doesn't really matter which side of the fence you reside on when it comes to painting furniture. All I ask is that you just be kind to people. If you see somebody painting a piece and you don't think it should be painted, unless it's your piece of furniture or you have some sort of literal connection to that piece, well, let me just say people can do what they want with their own furniture. <laughs> I follow a lot of Instagram and TikTok pages of people that refinish furniture in all capacities. The comments that I read, it's alarming. There are people threatening to kill other people because they painted a piece of furniture. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me. I understand being passionate about something and I cannot deny that in some cases pieces have been ruined by paint. And this here is a prime example of one that I nearly ruined with paint, but luckily I got a second shot at it and I'm trying to make that right. It's just furniture, though. The world has enough hate and bitterness in it. Just, just be nice. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so I have this approximately one third of the top um, done here and I'm gonna move on, but it's going really slowly with that little pick. So what I'm opting to do now is move on to a bigger nylon brush and the bristles on this one are a little bit firmer. You'll notice there is a little brass bristle section on the end of this. This is my last resort. <laughs> I hate using wire brushes on furniture, but sometimes you have no choice. So I'm doing what I can with the nylon bristles first. I'm gonna have to hit a couple spots a couple of times, but we'll see where we end up once this part is done. I'm using a slightly different technique initially here on the sides. You can see there's quite a difference in the color of the teak on the sides versus the top and that's because there's still a lot of the original finish on the sides. So I'm using my Baco scraper here and normally I don't recommend you use it with stripper. <laughs> it's mainly meant for dry application but I'm at the point where I need to sharpen it so taking it apart to clean out any of the stripper gunk is not a big deal because I need to sharpen it anyway. Once I have that original finish off, I am going to try the brass bristle brush. The brass bristles are a lot finer than nylon ones, but you notice, as opposed to the nylon brush where I was going back and forth, I'm only going in one direction with this. It's really easy to scratch the wood with brass, so you wanna be really careful, go as gentle as you possibly can in one direction.
Once I got most of the paint off the side, I noticed this corner had been filled with some filler. Because I'm trying to bring this back to wood grain, I'm going to try to get as much of the white out as I can because I'm going to be adding a colored wood filler instead. Oh, this is a great shot of the difference between the parts that I used the wire brush on, the fine brass bristles, and the part that was just scraped with no brushing at all. And you can see that most of the white is out of the right side, but there's still a little bit on the left there, so I need to keep going. And I apologize now that this video might seem a little long-winded or boring. The truth is that this took me a couple of days to do, and the majority of that was just getting the paint off, so unfortunately that's what most of this video is about. But it really is a beautiful transformation, and I'm super excited to show you what it looks like at the end. I'm using a little bit of the OD Safer Solvent here to just clean up some of the residual debris and dust and it also gives me a really good look at what this is going to look like with a clear coat and shows me where there are still areas of paint that I need to deal with. I'm using some tea colored wood filler here to fill these gouges that were on the edge of the piece. I had initially used the white filler, um, but I scraped as much of that out as I could in favor of the tea colored. I need to take the leg assembly off so that I can get rid of the paint from the bottom of the piece. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to be stripping back the drawers and the legs to their original teak color or leaving this two-tone look that I had initially done, but regardless of what I'm doing, I had to take the legs off so that I could sand it. Now, I recently purchased a bunch more of these cord clips, and these are great if you have a Festool vacuum or it might fit on other hoses as well, but I have a Festool vacuum here and it just keeps the sander cord attached to the vacuum hose, which is really, really handy and you don't get caught up in the cord. They're super cheap and you can order them right from the Surf Prep website and if you do decide to do that, you can use my code actually to get 10% off of your order. I'm opting to sand down the whole bottom. I'm not trying to get every bit of old finish off. I'm gonna reseal the bottom. The bottoms of pieces like this that are veneer, they often get super, super dry and will actually crack after time. So put some new oil on it and um, just nourish it. You'll notice that there are these strange lines or striations. Most of them follow the framework. You can see like this piece of trim on the front. There's a line that follows that. So I'm not worried about getting all of those lines completely bare. It honestly doesn't really matter that much. Once I have the bottom done, I'm going to flip the whole piece upside down and right here I'm removing the paint from the underside of the top. I'm going to be giving the mahogany veneer on the inside a bit of a refresh as well, so I'm just very lightly scuffing the surface. I'm going to be using Odie's oil on it, and I don't need to go right down to the bare wood to refresh it. All I need to do is just sort of scuff up the finish a little bit. I'm opting to use the Odie's Super Duper Everlasting oil on this piece, and I'll follow that with some of the Odie's wood butter later on. These are the Merca Merlon pads that I use to apply the Odie's. I get a lot of people asking about them. This is what they look like. Odie's is a little bit different than other oil finishes you might be used to, like hemp oil, where you flood the surface. You don't want to do that with Odie's. You want to use as little as possible, and these pads make it really easy to work it down into the wood grain with minimal waste. If 
If you notice here along the side of the piece, there's that darker strip of wood. That's actually a rosewood inlay. It's only on both sides of the piece. It's nowhere else on the piece, but just a cool little detail. Now you'll notice on the inside here that I haven't done anything with those white patched areas. Those I'm actually going to use special markers for. I'm going to try to mimic the wood grain as much as possible. There are still some areas both on the teak part and a little bit on the mahogany parts where there are some white flecks so I'm going to be using graining markers to try to deal with that. But overall so far I am super happy with how this is coming out. After about 45 minutes or so, it was time to wipe off the excess Odie's oil. This is a really important step and you really have to get all of the excess oil off. If you wipe the piece down and you draw your fingers across and you can see marks where your fingers were, like streaks, you didn't take off enough oil. You have to get it all off. So usually I go through a couple of towels. You want to keep turning your rag or towel over to a clean spot as you go along. This is a really physical product to use. I have a lot of people that try it out for the first time and they message and say, oh my gosh, I had no idea what a workout it was. And it is a workout, but it's worth it. I absolutely love this stuff. Now, <laughs> something super weird happened when I sat down just then. It's a little bit hard to tell here, but my entire epoxy floor is wet. It's wet. What's happening is that the humidity is high enough that the moisture in the air is just settling on the floor. It used to absorb into the concrete, but the epoxy is waterproof, so all that moist air just falls to the floor. So it was a trip to Home Depot for me. Thanks to all of you amazing folks who have sent me tea through the Buy Me A Coffee app over the last little while. You guys technically bought me this dehumidifier for the shop and I can't thank you enough. It is so much more comfortable in here now. Huge thank you to all of my supporters. I appreciate every single one of you. It doesn't matter if it's one tea or 10 teas, it's all so appreciated and it all goes to good use here in the shop. So thanks so much. I'm down to the finishing touches now, adding the Odie's oil to the underside. I'm gonna add some Odie's over top of the leg assembly and the drawer faces just going to give them a nice little refresh after four years of sitting.
initially I wanted this piece back so that I could use it to replace this piece, which is in our living room and desperately needs refinishing. Unfortunately, this TV is longer than the credenza I'm working on, so we are opting to replace this one here in the dining room. Okay, so let's have a quick trip back down memory lane here. I am very happy that the person who bought this from me initially decided to sell it about four years later and I was able to get it back and give it the makeover it truly deserved, which is basically trying to restore it as close to original as possible. The only part of my original redesign that I left the same was the two-tone drawers and legs. This is a piece I'm going to be keeping for a very long time. I honestly like that little bit of contrast. It looks really, really pretty with the rest of the teak and it kind of plays off that rosewood strip, which is nice as well, and the mahogany on the inside. While it was absolutely beautiful with the white, this piece is special enough and rare enough that it really deserved to be brought back to its gorgeous warm teak glow. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone watching. I really appreciate your support. If you think I redeemed myself, give me a thumbs up. If you don't think I redeemed myself, well, that's a bummer, <laughs> but I'm really happy with it. As always, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and turn on the notifications if you like this sort of content. Okay, the time has come. I've talked enough. Let's have a look at this piece now.